Well, I'm excited that you're all here today to talk about this really important issue. Um, I always told when you start a presentation, you want to start with a funny anecdote or something so you all relax and um, are happy and receptive. Today I'm going to throw that idea out the window and get negative right in the beginning. So <laughs> this is what we're facing right now. Let's see. Um, oops. Hold on. Let me just make this go. Okay. So science. Um, the journal 2019 in December came out with a report pervasive human-driven decline of life on Earth points to the need for transformative change. I'm going to have to go over here instead. Um, only immediate, in that article they talked about only immediate transformation of global business as usual economies and operations will sustain nature as we know it and us into the future. This follows the IPCC report in 2018 that said that we must reduce carbon emissions by half within a decade to have a 50% chance of avoiding global catastrophe. We're in really, really, really big trouble. I'm sure many of you in this room are scared. I'm personally scared. Um, I'm sure many of you are as well. We need to do something aggressive. Uh, we need to transform the places that we live, and we can do it in a way that's exciting um, and beautiful and more just. We just have to develop the vision. Extinction Rebellion um, activist group, they're calling for mass nonviolent rebellion to stop climate breakdown and social collapse. I'm personally involved in climate activism. I'm sure many of you are as well, some of the youth climate lobby, um, other efforts happening across the country. And I'd encourage all of you to do so um, even more. However, there's another way that we can be involved in activism. And I'm going to call this activism of imagination. Most people cannot envision a world that does not have fossil fuels. It's really hard. What does the world look like? What do the places that we live look like if we don't have um, fossil fuels? And it's scary. As architects, designers, and developers, and contractors, we have the opportunity to share that vision with the world and give people an idea of what it could look like um, if we go fossil fuel free. And it can be beautiful, and it can be better, and it can be more just. Uh, we just have to put our minds to it. We know the building science behind it. Uh, we just need to have the political will and just put some effort and creativity in it. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, too many podcasts, if you ask me. But um, one of the ones I was listening to recently, they were talking about leadership. And the, they talked about leaders are people that are able to give people a visual of what the world can look like. So Martin Luther King um, Jr., for example, his I Have a Dream speech, it's a beautiful speech. And one of the reasons why it's so beautiful is because it presents an image of what the world can look like with greater uh, equality. Um, that's something that people were able to get behind, that vision. We need to create a similar vision for how we can reframe our built environment so it's radically different and better and transformed without fossil fuels. So effect um, regen communities, I don't know if any of you have seen these images. In 2016 at the Venice Biennale of Architecture, um, this uh, effect architects out of Denmark came up out with these images and people went nuts over them. Um, it's the idea is for a community that uh, basically powers itself, transforms all of its waste, recycles it, um, zero energy and produces a huge amount of food um, is able to feed the population that lives there and then some. Uh, people went crazy. The people that made these images, and they're images, uh, it's supposed to be getting built at some point. Who knows if it really will? But people responded to these images. They were even invited to Obama's White House. There's excitement. It went viral um, because I think it shows hope and something new that we can be doing. So my firm is Biome Studio. I'm basically a one-person operation. Um, and I, what I do is on every single project, I work with other um, with teams. I pull together different teams of people that I collaborate with. So whether it's an art, um, an art installation, I have an art installation I just completed in Washington, DC that has to do with climate change. And on that, I brought together sound artists, videographers, singers, um, all sorts of people. On another project, like a building project, I might pull together architects, engineers, um, building scientists, carbon um, analyzers to really try to make these projects happen. But the goal of my company is to um, use art, architecture, public interventions um, to catalyze the built environment so that it can power itself, cleanse itself, transform waste, provide wildlife habitat, produce food, and enhance the lives of people. Now, have I been successful at doing all this on one project? No. 
but I'd like to. And I'm sure many of you in this room would like to as well, and we can get there. So my studio is um, a design and development studio. I have a kind of strange background. I'm an affordable housing developer, and I have expertise in building science, um, but I'm also a visual artist and designer. Um, so I'm interested in how do you combine all those worlds. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about the role that art can have in making our communities more exciting. And I think that one of the ideas behind that is that we need to make people fall in love with these places, these different places. And art can be a, a means of doing that. So this is what we're facing as a, a world right now. Um, those of us in this room, building operations, use 28%, um, produce 28% of the ca carbon dioxide emissions that lead to climate change. Um, building materials and construction use another 11%. Now, those of us who've worked in the industry for a long time, um, we've really focused on building operations. How do you get to zero energy buildings? And we're there. We know how to do it now. What we've failed at, I think, is many of us have failed at the building materials and construction. How do you create buildings with low embodied carbon or buildings that even store carbon? And I'm going to get into that um, because it's, it's totally doable. We just have to think about our buildings differently. So uh, as was mentioned before, um, I, I used to manage a portfolio of 90,000 apartments across the country, mainly on the East Coast, for wind companies. They're one of the largest affordable housing developers um, and property managers in the country. I came in as an affordable housing developer um, into their office. Uh, I quickly transformed my role into this director of green building. But while I was in this role, one of the things that I was struggling with, really frustrated, was that we always, regardless of how hard we tried and how many experts I had on a project, it was really, really hard to get to deep energy savings. And this is in the mid, um, you know, 2005, 2006 <coughs> time period. Um, really wanting to get deeper savings. I've known about climate change for a long time. Um, I did my first presentation in seventh grade. I was like, we got to do something about <laughs> this issue, and we're not going to get there if we're only getting 30% energy savings on our buildings. So I started looking at projects around the world, and um, I was also doing a lot of solar with them. I was doing a lot of lead platinum buildings. They were all doing pretty well on, um, on energy, but not good enough. And that's when I discovered Passive House. And this chart I saw um, sometime in the, you know, maybe 2008. Um, and, it was, and I was like, this is what we need to do. So Passive House standard building was this, but Passive House building was way down here in terms of energy consumption. And I said I, I wanted to jump on this bandwagon. Um, Passive House started in Germany, it, as many of you know. I know a lot of people here are from the Vermont Passive House group, but it quickly came over to the US um, with a lot of hard work. But I saw this article in 2009, Passive House gets all its heat and hot water from um, the amount of energy that would be needed to run a hairdryer. So I was one of the first people, um, part of the first group of people in the US that were trained in Passive House. Um, and I found it exciting. And I think that one of the things about Vermont is we, a lot of um, New England states like Massachusetts are doing a lot with Passive House. We're not doing enough here. Um, and I think we should be because I think it's a key way to get to zero energy. So we're seeing projects like um, single family, multi, small multifamily, but we're also seeing even high rises um, since that time that are going passive house. This is a high rise that's Cornell. Um, that's a passive house project. Um, this person here lives in that passive house high rise, pays $30 a month for electricity, heating, and air conditioning. So what does a passive house um, building what are the principles? And I'm sure many of you know these by heart. But um, it basically, continuous air um, insulation with minimal, if any, thermal bridging, uh, airtight construction, um, and then ventilation. So we're doing individualized um, ventilation in the units. And my multifamily buildings, I'm using energy recovery ventilation. And then we're t making tiny, tiny mechanical systems um, to meet the remaining load. So using, um, in my larger uh, multifamily projects, we're using variable uh, refrigerant flow systems, VRFs. Uh, then the uh, goal is that the remaining energy load of those buildings can then be met with renewables if you're, if you're lucky, depending on the scale of the building. So in some of our huge multifamily buildings, you need to put as much solar in the roof. You're not going to be able to get to zero energy because you just don't have enough roof area per apartments, but you want to push it as hard as you can. Um, one of the exciting things about the Passive House program is that the WOOFI modeling that um, 
we're using to get to Passive House, what we're seeing is that um, FIAS is looking back and seeing how those buildings are performing. And they're performing within 7% of what they were projected on those models, which is really good. Um, I, for those of you that are in the room that have been involved in doing energy modeling like in the two, uh, early 2000s, we never saw this. It was like total guesswork. Um, Passive House is taking the guesswork out so that our projections can be uh, much more right on. So um, again, the path to zero. So um, we know we can get to zero. We can do it with a lot of foam. We can insulate the hell out of our buildings um, and do it with a lot of foam. Uh, the problem is this is not the way to solve the climate change problem. Um, the materials that we use have a huge impact on, uh, on greenhouse emissions and foam, depending on what type it is, can have a huge amount of embodied um, carbon and uh, climate change emissions when they were created. Before I go on, I wanted to do a shout out to um, Jacob Rackusen and Ace McCarlton. Um, they're from New Frameworks. They're, many of you have probably heard them speak. They've really become the leaders um, nationally on uh, carbon, uh, embodied carbon in buildings. Um, they've spoken on it a lot, and I, I'm using just a few of their slides to explain some of these topics. Jacob and I are working on two pro the two projects um, that I'll show you today. Okay, so we knew that we're able to start getting to, we can get to zero energy or close to it with Passive House and other, um, and working really hard, but here we are with this 11% of greenhouse gas emissions because of the building materials that we use. So there's this, the problem is if we don't hit that, um, there's this huge spike in carbon emissions the day we build a building. On average, it takes 17 years to pay off those constructed, construction related emissions with better operating use. But if you remember in that first slide I showed, which was depressing, the IPCC, the IPCC report says that we have 18 years before irreversible climate change damage. What are we going to do? Um, we're in trouble. We need to be addressing these materials right from the get-go. Uh, and we do have the potential to deal with embodied carbon of our buildings right away. So Ace and um, Jacob, as, and also Chris Magwood, presented. They were the keynote speakers at Nessie. They did an amazing job. But this, this idea of carbon drawdown and using our buildings as carbon sinks is coming. Um, it's the next thing um, in terms of how we're thinking about buildings. And I'm really excited about it. I think it's something that's been missing from the discussion about green building um, since it started. So, when we're working on a project, we need to think about three things. Um, operational carbon, that's how much carbon emissions are result through operations, so how much energy the building uses. Let's try to go passive house, let's try to get to zero energy. That's how we can handle this. Um, but the embodied carbon and then carbon storage in buildings is the next step. So how do we, how do we think about that? So embodied carbon is the sum impact of all the greenhouse gas emissions attributed to the materials throughout their life cycle. So every single material in a building, from the structure, to the floors, to the finishes, to the insulation. Building Green um, had a, a, it has a series of articles right now um, looking at embodied carbon, and I really recommend you take a look at those if you have a chance. Um, but they, they bring up this, this thing. When we're thinking about materials, we need to think about how is it manufactured, what is the energy required to manufacture it, what is the energy required to transport it to the site, can it be maintained, repaired, and dismantled, and then what happens under its serviceable life. We need to be thinking about all of these aspects as we're selecting our materials. So this is um, a slide from 20 th uh, Architecture 2030. It's from 2018. I want to mention that this is about insulation. The exciting thing is uh, manufacturers are getting wise to these issues of embodied carbon and materials, and these are very, very quickly changing um, in terms of how much embodied carbon are different materials. So stay tuned. But um, some of our spray foams, foams that we've been using uh, have a huge amount of embodied carbon. And they're not going to pay for themselves, at least in a quick enough time, through energy savings. We need to be thinking about um, materials uh, and insulation that have a much lower embodied carbon. So on a lot of my projects, I'm flipping to mineral wool, fiberglass bat, and cellulose. Um, some of the manufacturers on the, density, high density, the, on the foams are trying to reduce this, um, the carbon emissions. And when I say carbon emissions, I, I, it's really greenhouse gas emissions. They're thinking more th than just carbon. Um, but it, uh, so some of the companies are starting to make these smaller, but we still need to be doing better. Uh, what's exciting about this chart is that this shows 
all the carbon um, emissions associated with these materials. But what's happening over here? We have a negative emissions. What's happening is these materials, denim bat, wool, um, cellulose, cork, hempcrete, and straw bale, are actually storing carbon in, um, in themselves. Um, this is how we start to transition into a carbon storing building. So what's happening? Well, um, during photosynthesis, basically the plants are taking carbon dioxide in and they're turning that carbon dioxide into the materials that make up their cells. So woody plant material is made up of carbon. Um, when we take that material and we harvest it, so say it's a tree, say it's straw, that material then goes into your building. If you protect the material, it, that material does not release uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or other greenhouse gas emissions until it decomposes. So if we protect the wood within our buildings, if we protect um, th th that material stays and it stores carbon. So we need to be thinking about how do we find these carbon storing materials and use them in our buildings. Um, so there's lots of plant-based materials. We have um, timber, wood fiber, cork, um, straw, cellulose, um, all these materials, hemp, and there's some products in the back, actually, afterwards, if you want to take a look. Um, but really thinking about materials that store carbon. So some of the areas that are your key areas where we're seeing the most um, embodied carbon. The most is in your structure. So that's things like um, your concrete, uh, your steel, uh, what's keeping your building up. And so the first goal is to really take a look at that and figure out, are there ways to reduce your carbon emissions in the structure itself? Um, the next area is your building envelope, and then finally, your finishes. Portland cement um, is responsible for 5% of the total global, up to 5% of global um, carbon dioxide emissions, depending on the source that we look at. So this is the key component in concrete. So in some of the projects I'm working on, we're trying to figure out how to reduce Portland um, and use maybe more fly ash or try to reduce the size of our structure. We're also looking at insulation. Um, so uh, Jacob from New Frameworks did this analysis for me as part of a project I'm, uh, we're working on together. Um, and so some of the foams that are now coming out that are trying to be, have lower embodied carbon, you're seeing those over here. But then he started looking at other products, mineral wool, cellulose. So I'm trying to pick materials for my projects over on this side uh, where they have very low embodied carbon or they're actually carbon storing, like cellulose. We're also looking at things like siding. Um, so wood siding, depending on the source, so FSC certified um, wood for siding uh, is actually carbon storing, which gets really exciting. Uh, it, if it's not FSC, it still it's, has some embodied carbon, but it's not as high as, say, brick or um, fiber cement siding. And so, but we, in addition to this, and this is where we all have to be skeptical, is that we get really excited, oh, this is perfect, well, let's just do wood. Well, we have maintenance issues, we have all that paint over time. So we need to be thinking about how do we re also responsibly pick um, different products to put, to finish those, those, that siding, to preserve it over time. Okay, so one of the issues is, if we don't think about embodied carbon, we can have a high performance building that results in more carbon emissions than um, a low performing building that it doesn't have high embodied carbon. And that, that's just very sad, because we, you know how hard we all work. We're trying to do the best we can, and then it turns out that overall, the environmental impact is worse than. Um, the good news is, though, it is possible to get to net zero embodied carbon in an affordable way using off-the-shelf products. So what some of those products might be cellulose insulation, we all have access to it. Um, it. We can use it. FSC wood with non-toxic finishes, lime and clay paints, and ag fiber insulation. Uh, the different, I'm not going to get that much into this, but there's lots of tools out there that are coming about to help us de um, determine embodied carbon. Tally, for example, use it, can connect to Revit, um, and it's a tool that can look at the overall embodied carbon of your building and also compare different um, products and approaches. 
Um, we have uh, environmental product declarations for many products. These are voluntary, so that not every product has them, but you can ask your manufacturer about them. But these are some of the tools that are available to help um, you calculate it. What I'm doing on my projects is I'm usually bringing in a carbon storing um, carbon expert. So Jacob uh, from New Frameworks, he's often consulting on my products, projects to help me select the materials. So overall, though, what should we be doing? Well, we need to do all these calculations, but this is really the big point. We need to use less materials. Um, we need to ask ourselves the question, do we need to build that building? Does it have to be that large? Do we really need all this stuff? I was talking to one of my real estate developer friends who is no way like um, you know, a huge green building advocate, and we're having a conversation about climate change, um, and he never really cared about these issues in the past, and he says, you know what? He said, I, I shouldn't say this too loud, but I think we need a moratorium on building anything for the next 10 years until we figure this thing out. He's probably right. But here we are, and we're all still building. So in the meantime, let's figure out how to do less and do it better. OK, so I want to talk about a few, um, two projects that are, we're considering these, these um, concepts. This is Moran Square. It's in Fitchburg. Um, Fitchburg, Massachusetts is a small um, post-industrial city. It's always been struggling economically, lots of vacant buildings. Um, so this is our site. We have a historic firehouse, a vacant lot, which will be a five-story building, and then a three-story um, commercial building, which will also be housing. This is our firehouse. Um, this is where a vacant, vacant lot, which will be a five-story building. Uh, and then here's our commercial space, which will be um, housing above, and then retail below, which we're hoping is going to be um, artist studio space. On this project, um, what we're going to be doing is creating 44 units of affordable housing. I've always focused my career on affordable low-income housing, so we're using low-income housing tax credits, but we're also using historic tax credits. And historic tax credits are very, um, the buildings are really regulated, so I'm limited on what I can do to change these buildings, uh, and regulated by the National Park Service, so it's very, very stringent. Uh, we will be one of the first projects in the country, if not the first, to be passive house that's also a historic tax credit project. Project. So it's, a it's been a challenge. Um, this is, let's see, so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, so in terms of material reduction, the first thing is that we're doing is we're reusing existing buildings. We're building one new building in an urban infill siting. We've also picked a site where people can walk. Um, we're, but reusing existing buildings is huge. We have a tendency to go and tear things down. Um, we need to be reusing. And so that, that's really big. Um, the next thing is we're doing on the energy side, passive house and solar PV. This has been a big challenge because with historic tax credit projects, there is compatibility there um, in that we have the projects are beautiful, you're reusing something old, they have lots of character, but with the regulations, um, we had to really think differently about how we're going to achieve our energy goals because the, the, the National Park Service even regulates how much insulation we have within the building, but we're going to be able to get there. Um, on the concrete side, what our goal is is to reduce Portland and increase fly ash and this is in the new building. Uh, we're working with our structural engineer to help um, develop a spec that is still going to make the building stand up, but really tries to reduce the amount of Portland that's in that mix. For siding, Jacob and I got really excited. We're like, yes, we can do FSC wood on this building. It's going to be great. It's going to be, we're going to get, f go from low embodied carbon to carbon storage, um, and we're not going to use brick uh, and fiber cement. Suddenly, no. Um, the historic regulations are requiring us to do brick on the new building. So that was right off the bat. Um, and the, the owner and the architect were really uncomfortable with us not using fiber or cement siding because they're worried about long-term maintenance. Um, I think we should be able to think differently about this for future projects, but it is an issue. It's just like a reality check. It's an affordable housing property. It doesn't have a lot of income over time. Um, so these were big things. On the insulation, what we're doing is using cellulose, eco-fiberglass, mineral wool, and gravel. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We're working with Building Science Corporation to figure out how to do that, especially in the historic buildings. Um, but in some locations, I said foam free, but in some locations we're using low uh, GWP, global wiring potential foam. Um, structure, we're using wood instead of um, metal for our dimensional lumber. Um, and I wanted to do FSC wood, but our contractor said he can't find it for a project of this scale. I don't know if that's true, um, but that's what I've been told. 
Um, and then finally, on the mechanicals, we're using variable refrigerant flow, air source heat pumps, and central energy recovery ventilation, um, ERVs. Uh, on the compromise, we're using natural gas for hot water um, because I'm, we've been told that by our uh, engineers that the heat pumps are not, for a building of the scale, going to uh, work that effectively. I'd be very curious in the conversation at the end if anyone has had different experiences with larger um, buildings and heat pumps for the hot water. Um, this is our WFI model for the passive house. Uh, what you're seeing is the R values. They differ depending on the size of the building. So in our new building, the walls are R37. In the historic buildings, they can be only R23. And that's because of historic regulations and how thick they're allowing us to build up the walls inside the building. New construction. Um, this is a project in Cambridge. It's uh, Cambridge Finch, uh, it's in Massachusetts. It's um, done by HRI. It's affordable housing, but it really gives shows what a wall section might look like in our new construction building. So we're doing. Uh, they did uh, uh, air barrier uh, membrane applied air barrier. Really nice detailing around the windows. The windows are casement windows, and then on top of that, they built out the windows so that they can then add a track system um, with low thermal bridging that has a uh, mineral wool. We'll have, in our system, we'll have four inches of mineral wool on the outside of our building. Um, and then on the inside of the building, we will have two by six stud walls that are full of cellulose. So again, carbon storage. I love to use cellulose on my demising walls, too, because that, again, gets into carbon storage. Um, it's questionable if the project can afford it. If they can't afford it, we'll go to eco-fiberglass, which one of those earlier slides shows it has low embodied carbon, but it's not carbon storing. Um, on the historic building, that's where it gets much more challenging. In the basement, we're going to be using gravel. And this is a really cool product. It's in the back. Um, in St. Albans, they're opening a plant to make this here. Currently, it's only made in, um, in Europe. So this is very exciting. But basically, recycled glass that looks like and performs like gravel. Um, and, so we can, and, and that is used on our slab. So we avoid using foam um, for our slab. And we're then replacing gravel. So we, we lose a product um, in the process, which is exciting. Uh, we have attics, so easy to deal with. We're going to be doing um, blown in cellulose. This is probably the easiest part of the entire project. And then the wall section. Again, historic buildings. When I was doing my high performance historic mill projects, what we do is we do high density spray foam. And I had to fight for that. Um, and it turned out it's totally wrong from a climate change perspective, which stinks. But um, so now what we're doing here is something different. Working with building science, we created this wall section. So we're doing a liquid applied air barrier right on the brick. On top of that, we're doing mineral wool. Then we're doing our vapor, bar um, vapor semi-permeable, um, sorry, our uh, variable perm vapor retarder on top of that. And then we're doing our two by six walls that are filled with uh, um, studs wood that are filled with cellulose. Um, and that's how we're handling our wall section. And then our windows are a whole other issue. So if, if those of you have, who've dealt with um, historic tax projects, how are you going to do your windows? Um, you can't get to passive house, generally speaking. I don't know any projects that have with a double hung window. Um, we're allowed to replace our windows, but they need to look like double hung windows. We got approval from National Park Service to use this project as a case study project. And we're going to be piloting using um, Zola windows. They're simulated double hung windows. So they look like double hung, and, um, but they perform like a casement or awning, most likely um, in our project like this. So this is going to be the first project that's a historic tax credit project to use these. So hopefully they look good. If they do, they'll let others in this room use them on future projects. So it's pretty exciting um, to see. But this, was, this is key. We didn't know if, if we felt like if we didn't use these, we wouldn't get to Passive House because we wouldn't get to our air leakage. Um, our, we'd have too much air leakage and not pass that requirement. We're also installing probably a 140 kW PV system. So some of this um, information, I just wanted to um, call out 475 Building Supply has some really good resources on um, foam-free wall assemblies. And there are free books that are available. You can download them. Um, a good place to start. I, I wouldn't cut and paste into your plans. You need to give it some thought, of course. Um, but it's a good place to start. It helped me kind of get my feet wet and start thinking about what wall sections could look like. Um, really excellent resource. 
So I wanted to kind of go in a little bit different direction, which is mass timber. And uh, mass timber, there's a lot of excitement about the idea of using mass timber to replace um, steel and um, it basically a big steel buildings. Um, the idea is to transform our cities into a, from a carbon uh, source to a carbon sink. Um, there's been analysis done uh, by Timber City and Gray Organsky Architecture, which is showing that mass timber um, high-rise concrete and steel is emitting 30, mid-rise 3,200 tons of carbon dioxide, where the same mass timber building would be um, storing 4,700 tons. Mass timber buildings are being built um, starting in the United States. We were st Europe, you saw a lot of these. Um, in the US, you're starting to see a few. In Montreal, Quebec City, we're seeing quite a lot of them. Um, the way that they work is cross-laminated uh, timber um, and glue lamb uh, posts and beams, uh, basically pieces of wood glued together um, to form these. And the buildings go up quickly. They, require, they don't weigh as much. So you have um, lower, you don't need as much foundation, you can use less concrete, and uh, depending on how they're sourced, they can be carbon storing. Nordic is a manufacturer of these. They have a plant 500 miles north of us in Quebec. Mass timber buildings can also be passive house. Um, again, you do your air barrier on the outside of the building um, in your insulation to get there. But you need to be careful. I got really excited about mass timber. I, I was like, we should do you know, the hole in Burlington by the mall. Let's do that mass timber. Like We just have to do this. This is so exciting. So I started doing a lot of research on the web and realized in Portland, Oregon, where they've done a lot of mass timber, um, Sierra Club and a bunch of other organizations came out in opposition to the mayor and said, hey, you got to slow down. Um, we need to make sure that the wood that we use in mass timber is from sustainable sources, FSC. And we also need to make sure the glue is um, low VOC or no VOC. And they're absolutely right. Or we're just going to see our forest clear cut. And it's not going to do us any good. So I wanted to just um, leave with one project, which is the Forbes building in Boston. Um, this is a project where I've kind of tried to coalesce a lot of these ideas. In December, I was approached um, to be part of a team to put together a proposal uh, for this project. And I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not. Um, but it's 147 units in Boston, right in Jamaica Plain, walkable neighborhood. Looks kind of like your standard uh, affordable housing project. It's going to be um, renovated as an occupied renovation. So people will live in the, their apartments when we do the work. I, the first thing that we're going to be doing at the project uh, is what would be a deep energy retrofit. So as was mentioned, I was part of the team um, that spearheaded a deep energy retrofit of ca at Castle Square Apartments in Boston. Um, we finished construction on this in 2011. Um, standard affordable housing property, uh, big uh, air leakage, um, very little insulation. And with a deep, deep energy retrofit, what we're doing here is super insulating the building from the outside. It's a little bit hard to see with the light, but what um, this shows different stages of construction. But basically what we do first is a liquid applied air barrier. Um, on top of that, we, let's see if this is better. Uh, so we do our liquid applied air barrier on the outside of the building, mineral wool, and then a super insulated R40 shell. On that, on that building. Now, we used, um, we used foam here, which is too bad. Uh, but the, the project had really extensive energy savings and has inspired many, many others to do deep energy retrofits. This is what it looked like after. Our mechanical systems in 2011, we didn't have ERFs. We didn't have ERVs for a building of this scale. And Passive House, even though we talked to FIAS about the project, they weren't ready to do this project Passive House. It was too um, beyond what they could do. But today, we can do it. We can do a building like this where we super insulate it from the outside, use tiny mechanical systems, and get to Passive House, um, and then meet the main remaining energy demand with, um, with a lot of the remaining energy demand with solar. So the, one other issue with this building, after we begin to wrap it in the new shell and transform it, is thinking about developing a carbon storage materials pallet. So from day one, having a materials pallet that is carbon storing. So everything from how we're going to handle the walls to how we're going to do flooring, materials, anything new that we're going to build, we're going to pick from a pallet that is um, carbon storing. 
We're also going to be doing uh, low cost, low carbon apartment renovations. So we're going to be replacing the windows as part of the deep energy retrofit. But could we use wood? Can we use high R value uh, wood windows, have that biophilia experience using wood? Can we do wood flooring? Ca um, carpets, because they're replaced so often, have actually a kind of a large global warming impact. Um, so could we go with wood? <coughs> Typical in an apartment renovation, you always rip out your cabinets. Like, if they're dated, we don't want them. What if we keep them? Um, I kind of like these cabinets. They're really retro looking. And could we do some fun things, like update it with, you know, maybe interesting murals or wallpaper, the apartment of therapy inspired kind of work that's simple, um, low carbon, because we're not getting rid of it. We're also discussing the idea of increasing density. Uh, when I saw the photos of this project first, I got really excited. I was like, these terraces are great. We could do um, rooftop gardens, maybe farming, uh, lots of solar. Turns out they're oriented the wrong way. They face north, so they're shading, they're shading out. Um, what our concept would be is to fill this in with a mass timber addition. Uh, we could add, if we fill in the tiers, we now create a flat roof um, a pie that allows for solar, and we add about 40 units of housing, which is so um, very much needed in Boston, affordable housing. So what would a mass timber addition look like? Um, Gray Argansky Architects is doing some really nice work on this in, uh, in New Haven, where you can actually add the mass timber right to the top of the building, and it, the building generally does not need to be reinforced because the mass timber is so light and, it, and because of other structural reasons. This is a project they did in Firehouse Project in New Haven, gorgeous building that they renovated, um, turned into an artist um, performance space recording studio and has housing above, um, but they needed more housing. So they created this mass timber addition that I just find to be really exciting um, how it looks. It has a really woody feel, um, it's beautiful, beautiful space, and is carbon storing. Activating the roof here, maybe it starts to look like this as you add your mass timber addition. Um, thinking about biosolar, can you combine solar PV with plants on the roof? Can we also be thinking about constructed wetland space? This is the way you enter the building now. It's really uncomfortable. So we, can we have a constructed wetland in performance space? Can we have maker space? Um, can the, up, the building start to look like this instead? What's, uh, what kind of work is inspiring to the, the project? Um, this is a sculpture I did a number of years ago. Um, can we have you know, herb gardens, a DIY aesthetic? So the members of our team have been involved in eco-machines, living machines, biohabitats um, to clean wastewater. Now the building is existing, so we can't replumb the entire building. But what we can do in the addition and also any community spaces is there is the potential to recycle that wastewater and reuse it on site um, for any new plumbing that we're doing. Growing food here is hard um, because it's north facing, but maybe we can do some foraging plants for demonstration. Maybe we can do mushroom um, gardens, uh, which love um, the shade. And then um, the final aspect is this issue of art. And I mentioned I'm a visual artist. Um, I think art is an important part of the story um, for um, making the places that we transform places that people love. And we're talking about making maker space. This is currently very typical lobby um, community spaces in multifamily affordable housing. It looks like hell. It's very uncomfortable. No one's there. Um, what if these are transformed into maker spaces? What if they become art studio spaces? As an artist living in Boston, I always struggle to find a space. Um, what if it suddenly becomes energized and exciting um, and fun? And we're also talking about putting outside a new community space um, that will also be a co-working space uh, with more of a DIY aesthetic. So f final thing I just wanted to mention is this idea of building as art. Um, there's a lot of artists working in the world. I'm one of them that are interested in how do we transform our buildings so that they become artworks. And when we're thinking about climate change, perhaps this seems frivolous. Like we have all these other issues. Why would we even think about art? And I think art is about can make life more fulfilling. Um, it can make people embrace some of these concepts if we create excitement around them. And it also, if you're making and, and 
creating with your hands, you're not consuming as much. Um, it, it, I think it can, it, it can be part of the answer. This is a project I did in Frederick, Maryland. Um, it burned out building, lost its second story. When I got on the scene, it looked like this. It had been sitting vacant for years, uh, boarded up, no second story. The owner was not able to uh, renovate it. He didn't have enough insurance money. In this space, I created this project called Sky Stage. And what it is are, it's an open air theater with plants that wind in and out of all the doors and windows. Um, on a scaffolding system, the plants are, uh, get their water from the adjacent roof in a, in a water basin for storage. Uh, the space is used every day, um, most of the year, which is kind of incredible. You can't see these, these slides at all, can you, with the light in here? But um, <laughs> you basically, the space is used all the time um, for low cost uh, art, um, there's an amphitheater among trees. Uh, we have music, there's performances, there's yoga, there's free lunch programs. Uh, a lot of work is happening. Other artists like Matthew Mazzotta, who used to live in Burlington a long time ago, um, he's a collaborator from on other projects of mine. Um, he created in this Nebraska downtown a storefront with a secret. It turns into a theater. And it completely transformed this downtown area. One thing to mention is, what does a post-fossil fuel economy look like? Well, maybe we don't have as many cars. Maybe we start changing our roads into places where we gather. One of the things that came out of this project is that the people in the community got so into it that they created an old, their own movie of, um, of, of like this old time movie, which was the first movie that was shown at this theater. Now, I want to, again, talk about this idea of community. We need community to deal with climate change. We need people to come together to both solve the problem and also deal with emergencies. We've got to build this community now. Art can be used as a way to do that. Um, another project, Theatra Gates, um, took this old bank building in the south side of Chicago, uh, created, made it a celebration of uh, black art and black archives. Um, and this is a project in London where they took, again, it's like we, we have this abandoned um, gas station, again, a fossil fuel economy, this is what it looks like post. We're going to have tons of abandoned gas stations. Let's turn them into theaters um, where people can gather and have fun. And then uh, Rick Lowe, this is in Houston. Again, it's about people coming together to, to create change. I'll just leave you with one photo. This is, I live in Glover. Um, my kids were involved in organizing the Youth Climate March, um, climate strike in Glover, and it was a great day. Um, it was a sad day that we had to do this, but it was a great day to see how many people in my small town are really worried about these issues and want to do something. Uh, we have an opportunity to do something. We just have to come together and get creative and, and, and help create that vision. So. Thank you. I think we have um, 10 or so minutes for questions for, for Heather, so. Yep. That was great, thank you. Thanks. Um, the question I have is, what's your role as a, as a, a building science person in encouraging your clients to build smaller, build less, um, think about not growing. And um, I'm just thinking about so many projects around Burlington right now, like the Hannaford, the new Hannaford project right. at the Kmart, the, the Moran plant, you know, not to mention the, the hole in the middle of the city. But um, so many things that, that need to be rethought in terms of no business as usual, but I'm wondering what your role is in that. Sure. I think that's a really great question. Um, wow, I don't know if I have an answer to that, what my, my personal role is. I mean, I think I'm doing a lot of conversations with people about these topics. Um, a lot of my artwork, which we didn't talk about, oh, yeah, I showed that one project, but it has to do with this questions of consumption and how we're living. Uh, but I think it's a thing that we should be asking all of our clients. So if you're an architect, if you're a designer in the room, to say, do we need that? Um, on that project I'm doing in Fitchburg, the, the firehouse and all that, uh, one question came up of like, well, of course we should have garbage disposals for um, th all the units. And it's like, well, do we need another machine in there? Um, do we need to have more layers of stuff in this building? So that's something on a single project, I'm asking the question of how can we use, do less in the building? How can we add less layers, uh, less finishes? 
But uh, on these bigger questions of how our community, what we decide to invest in, like do we need a new building to replace um, this building in Burlington? Maybe that's where the community comes in and asks those questions. I didn't share, I, there's another project I've, I worked on in Pittsburgh where we took an old, we're taking an old synagogue building um, and school uh, to build um, more affordable housing and a community art center. On that project, it, it, the original conversation was let's tear down the old school. It's like 1950s, it's ugly. But we pushed our team to say let's keep it. It's, it's actually harder to keep it, but let's keep it because we're benefiting from the embodied carbon within those buildings. Um, same thing goes with you know, maybe even some of our big box stores, like as, as instead of knocking them down, or how do we retrofit those um, so that we can do something better in those, those things. Yep. Thank you so much for bringing this perspective to us. <coughs> it's, it's really inspiring. Uh, I'm Tom Visser. I direct the Historic Preservation Program here at the University of Vermont in Burlington. We have a couple of our students here. And <coughs> the whole field of historic preservation right now is transforming itself into what we're calling proactive preservation. And to see the number of call-outs that you, you brought about ways that you are incorporating existing buildings, respecting the past, but also dealing with our, 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 our future. This is, this is very, very impressive work. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've worked at, at first I love historic buildings. I'm really passionate about them. And I've worked on a lot of projects. A lot of times in the building science industry or as developers, people are like, oh, we don't want to have to deal with these, all these regulations. And they can be hard. Um, but I've always tried to challenge myself to try to do energy efficiency in the best projects we can within those. And I think we can go further. Like I did the, one of my projects was the first lead platinum historic mill conversion in the country. And we, we were able to get there um, within the regulations but we, and create this really beautiful building. And you have more character, but they also you're benefiting from the embodied carbon of those buildings. Um, I'm wondering how you see the consideration of embodied carbon moving from like a voluntary thing that an organization might choose to do um, to something that is a little bit more widespread? Like, are there other places in the world where codes are starting to look at it? Or That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. On the passive house, you're seeing some states where they're incentivizing to go passive house. So this is different than embodied carbon. But like in Massachusetts, for low-income housing tax credits, um, you get additional points. Same thing with New Hampshire, if you do passive house. We should be doing that in for embodied carbon as well, um, whether it's you know some kind of speeding up your permitting process or you get more tax incentives I think it's I think it's key and we need to be doing it fast um, and I think that's where the balance between you know I started out I mentioned Extinction Rebellion if you haven't looked into them they're kind of a radical group really pushing um, uh, radical activism around climate change. We need radical activism around climate change. We need really um, uh, different types of public policy if we're going to deal with this on a mass mass level. And things like it might not seem glamorous that we should be pushing for you know passive house um, policy or carbon storage policy, but it's something that needs to happen nationally and globally if we're going to um, address these issues. It, and it has to happen like really fast. So I feel an urgency. I'm sure many of you do too. Um, and and I. I want to be more engaged in that, and I, I'm not sure how to do it, but I, I'm trying. Um, I see in your list of your carbon uh, portfolio there, uh, to, to, are you familiar with graphene at all as a concrete additive? No. Um, it's actually getting a lot, and they use waste material at a very high, I don't know what it's energy level is, because they burn it, and then they get this graphene, and it's a, supposedly a very good lightweight uh, friendly um, additive for concrete and, and other things. It has a lot of industrial uh, application. Also on your, where you were using um, uh, natural gas for the hot water in that one building, why didn't you look at doing, or I'm sorry, could, could you not have looked at doing distributed heat pump hot water heaters and not yeah. go with that central <coughs> Everybody gets it, and you continually, uh, you know. It, the yeah, we did we did look at doing the individual um, hot water heat pumps, and it affects the overall energy. It, you were saying space, or but it also affects the overall energy of the building too, because you're dumping heat into the building when you might not want to at different times of the year. Um, so we decide, and also from a maintenance perspective, we decided not to do it. I don't want to use natural gas in my buildings anymore. I don't think we should be. On this project, I made an exception. Um, we're going to try to do better next time. But I'm told very soon we're going to see better heat pumps for commercial large-scale water um, coming out. Uh, and that's what kind of we're all waiting for. When I did that Castle Square project, that deep energy retrofit that we finished like nine years ago, 
there weren't, I don't know if you noticed, but we used through the wall air conditioners for, um, we had uh, trickle vents, which are these like little holes in the walls for our um, fresh air, makeup air. And we had a two pipe system for heating. For heating. Um, do you know how much the, the industry has improved in the last nine years? Like all these, these, this equipment wasn't available just then. And that was only nine years ago. Um, so we have a potential, if, we, if there's a demand for it, I think that we're going to see like, better hot water production and so many new um, approaches to deal with these issues. There was a question in the back. What are the best ways to invest in these changes? Um, and I hear all kinds of talks about investing in different markets and whatever, but how and do I best support to implement advances in these technologies so we don't have to wait nine years for the best available version of this building so that we can avoid um, potential mistakes and speed up the permitting process for these things so that when I appreciate this, when you called yourself out on, on foam in, in, in that building that you did forever ago, like that was really cool to hear you say, how can we avoid the human error that, that is, is inevitable, but how can we minimize the potential effects that we can't see coming? Well, I guess one question is, how many people in this room are designing a building right now or developing one? Okay. So th those of you that are doing that, um, right now you can go back to your office and like, Go, oh my gosh, I can't believe all this stuff, but we have to do now. But we can go back right now and we can start looking at um, our project list of materials. I, on that project I mentioned in Fitchburg, I was brought on, on the team after they got their historic tax credits and after they were awarded their low income housing tax credits. So in the last six months, we totally changed the way we were material usage and we went to Passive House. Um, we can do that right now on our projects and we should. So talk to your friends that are architects or designers or developers. This needs to be a priority in all of our buildings. So that's the first starting point. Um, the second point is that um, someone like Jacob Rakusen um, at New Frameworks, he's meeting with manufacturers right now. He's been traveling around the country meeting with manufacturers and saying, we need to have this. Um, and they're making changes fast. Some of the foam guys saw the writing, are seeing the writing on the wall. And so they're developing new um, foam, uh, recipes, uh, technical term, um, but there's so many new foam recipes right now that are so much better than they were before. Um, but again, we also need to question what we're doing. And that question before of like, why are we doing this? Why, like, we don't have to live like this. We don't even have to build this stuff. Like, we could live in a totally different way. Um, I want to. I wish someone would tell me how to do it. Um, but I, we can do things really differently, and we need to do things really aggressively. Um, yep. And if the money, if someone wanted to promote this and had, you know, basically was an angel investor uh, and could invest in uh, doing net zero retrofits, really deep energy retrofits of, of schools, I think that would be the best thing that could happen in the whole state, you know, because it would help educate people about what you need to do, but it also, there's so many people in the schools right now that are so focused on cost, you know, that they're not seeing the bigger picture. And, you know, in South Burlington, we have a proposal to tear down some completely, right. completely useful schools and build an entirely new one because it would be net zero. But they actually aren't using efficient heat pump systems and, you know, they just want to build a, a new building. And I think that there's got to be somebody that says, no, a deep energy retrofit plus an addition. And to use your artistic flair <laughs> to present you know, these school boards with an option that is so much better than what they're being presented with, I think needs to happen. I, I agree. And I think you know, this idea of, I talked about like create activism through creative imagination. As designers, or if you're not a designer, but you're a person that wants to become active in this, you know, I know that I know that project. I've heard about it in Glover, um, where you know we can barely afford to do anything to anything in our buildings. Um, but it, it's go to the board, show them a different example, show them something else that could happen there. Um, and it can be, you know, a lot of times we as just people we want the answer, so we get really excited about like a net zero school. It sounds so much better, but it, the steps that are taking 
to build that school, you know, they're having a big climate change impact. Everyone wants to solve the climate change issue. So let's show that, that we can do it in a more holistic way that might be more affordable, more equitable, and also um, uh, better for the environment. But you have to present that vision. So I think, I think schools are a great place. Affordable housing, people are always really surprised. That's been my area, that affordable housing developers have been the leader in doing green building in the country. And I think it's because before you're usually in affordable housing because you care about like social issues, so maybe there's some overlap there. Um, but a lot of it too, a lot of the agencies have incentivized affordable housing developers to, to um, do the right thing through energy efficiency, passive house, and other programs. Um, so they're doing it at market. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, by the way, my background's kind of weird. And you know, I'm an artist. I have this building science stuff. But I'm also I'm trained as a real estate developer. I went to MIT for that. I the reason why I did that was I was working early in my career um, for NYSERDA, which is like Vermont efficiency Vermont, um, doing incentives for programs. And I kept basically I felt like I was like bribing developers to do the right thing. I mean, I wasn't really, but I, w I was. I was like, can you please do this? Finally, I was like, I should just be the developer because I'm so sick of people telling me, no, we can't do this. And so as a developer, it always helped me because I could say, we can find more money for these things. When I did projects like that, um, the first lead platinum mill conversion in the country, my, my uh, boss was shocked. He's like, I, I didn't even know we got lead platinum. How did we do that? Didn't it cost more? Well, it doesn't have to. Um, they, we just have to think differently about these projects. And as developers, we also have to th think about ways to move the money around um, because we can. We don't need to do some fancy, th use some fancy elements. Um, we can use that money elsewhere. These are choices that we can make. I think that companies that are thinking about developing new recipes that are for um, climate change are really thinking about indoor air quality. I didn't mention, but the red list items, like items that you don't want to have for indoor air quality and health, um, generally it's the same companies that are limiting those that are also dealing with these issues. Um, passive house buildings are also much better ventilation, lower pests because you have less air leakage between units, less places for pests to move. So all of this is connected. Yeah, so the scale issues of mass timber, I mentioned I got really excited about it and then sort of found that letter in Portland, Oregon. Um, one of the things that you're seeing in Europe is some of the mass timber that's happening there, uh, a <laughs> lot of it was coming from sustainable sources and then quickly it started moving over to Eastern Europe where there was like no regulations on the forest, um, which results in clear cuts and then you end up having much worse um, situations. Um, I think that it's possible uh, to use mass timber in a sustainable way, and I think you can get to, um, to get to scale, uh, but we have to be thinking about how that source and how we're using our forests. Um, people have talked to you about, like for example, the mills in Maine, um, a lot of, because paper has uh, just bottomed out, uh, so a lot of the waste product from lumber was, is no longer being used um, because it's, uh, it, it's not being used for paper. So people are converting now to Gutex, which is back there. It's an um, insulation made out of that waste timber. So thinking about how to use the timber in a different way, um, I think it's feasible. We just have to be really smart and careful. Really, really careful. That's like all this. I'm going to be skeptical um, as we proceed. So great. Thank you. I'm Thank available you. to answer questions. Thank you. If you want.